Thank you for visiting this video of St. Luke United Church of Christ in Beecher, Illinois. I am Tom Ewing, the pastor here. This video contains the focus scripture lesson and the message that will be deliver delivered later this morning at 1015 in our sanctuary located at 725 Penfield Street. The worship service will be recorded and placed on our church's YouTube and Facebook pages and should be available by mid-afternoon. We hope you can join us in person later this morning, but if not, thank you for spending time with us on the internet. The focus scripture lesson today is from the third chapter of Luke, verses 15 to 17 and 21 to 22. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. According to the Gospel writer Luke, John the Baptist was baptizing people on the banks of the Jordan River. Then Luke makes one of the most startling pronouncements in the New Testament. He writes, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. Each year on the first Sunday after Epiphany, liturgical churches celebrate the baptism of our Lord. For us, it is a major event. The Son of God submits to being baptized at the hands of a somewhat eccentric preacher called John the Baptist. Mark describes John as wearing clothes of camel's hair, living on locusts and wild honey, make his, making his home in the wilderness. John admits that he's not worthy to carry Christ's sandals. In fact, he seeks to deter Jesus from being baptized at his unworthy hands. And yet Jesus comes to John to be baptized. It's a remarkable scene. He who was without sin submits himself to a religious rite that most of us associate with the symbolic act of washing sin away. The rite of baptism is so important to our identity as Christians that it's required in one form or another of all who have become part of the body of Christ. And notice what happens next after Jesus' baptism. Luke writes, and as he was praying, note those words, and as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. You've heard or read those words many, many times. It's a most familiar scene, but have you noticed those words coming immediately after Jesus' baptism? And as he was praying. Was it not entirely natural that Jesus immediately following his baptism should pray? Prayer, prayer played a major role in his entire ministry. Here he was, the very manifestation of God on earth, and yet he felt the need to be in continuous communication with his Father. Contrast his example with the practice of many of us. We have a very limited acquaintance with the Father, yet we spend only a nominal amount of time in prayer. Herb Miller in his book, Evangelism's Open Secrets, tells about a student work director at a large university who was giving a guest speaker a tour of the campus ministry building. And as they walked down the hallway, the guest saw a sign marked prayer room over a doorway. As they moved past the door to that prayer room, it became obvious that the director didn't intend to show his guests that particular room. Curious, the speaker reached for the knob, and as he opened the door, his nostrils were assaulted by a musty smell. He reports that the room was stuffed with boxes, boots, clothes hangers, and junk. On a little altar stood a pair of worn cowboy boots, an old Gilby's vodka box, and a roll of toilet tissue. Remember, this was the prayer room for the university's campus ministry. A bit embarrassed, the director explained quickly, we use this for storage room during the summer. Just haven't got it cleaned out yet. Herb Miller writes, at first it seemed like a sacrilegious thing to a visitor, stacking a prayer room full of junk. But then he realized that the room was a parable of his own life. He was so busy traveling around the country speaking and doing good things, he had lost the habit of praying. 
The time he had formerly spent talking with God each day was now crowded full of other things. That's happened to many of us. We're so busy that we have crowded out the ne one necessary practice for a truly successful life. Jesus never let that happen. Immediately after he was baptized, Jesus was praying. And what happened next? Luke tells us, the heaven opened. What an exciting statement. When good people pray, good things happen. The heaven opened. Some of you will remember the name Sister Elizabeth Kenny. You'll recognize her name primarily because as a self-trained nurse in the Australian bush country in the first half of the 20th century, Sister Kenny developed a new and successful approach for treating victims of a disease that crippled many young people back then called polio. Her method, which was bitterly contested at the time within the medical community, differed from the conventional medical practice at the time. The conventional practice, referred to as splinting, called for placing affected limbs in plaster cast, a practice that was not only quite uncomfortable, but ineffective as well. Instead of putting polio sufferers in plastic cast, Sister Kenny applied a hot, hot compresses, compresses to the affected parts of her patients' bodies, followed by a passive movement of those bodies to reduce what she called spasm. How did she happen on this humane treatment before science gave us vaccines for this dread disease? Well, one day, Sister Kenny was called to the bedside of a seven-year-old girl who lived there in the Australian bush country. The girl had extreme pain, a high fever, and the muscles of her leg and foot were contracted. Sister Kenny didn't recognize the symptoms, so she dispatched a rider on horseback to a telegraph station 20 miles away to get expert advice over the telegraph wires. Finally, the reply came back, the symptoms you describe indicate infantile paralysis. There is no known cure. Do the best you can. Out of necessity, Sister Kenny devised the unique program of treatment for this dread disease that has already been discussed or described. Did it work? It did. Later, when she received the recognition she deserved for her discovery, Sister Kenny was asked, what did you do first, referring to her medical procedure? Did you tear up a blanket for the hot packs? No, Sister Kenny replied. The first thing I did was kneel down and say a prayer. What happens when we pray? The heaven opens. When good people pray, good things happen. In Sister Kenny's case, she happened on a new therapy for hundreds of thousands of God's suffering children. When Jesus prayed on the day he was baptized, the heaven opened. And then we read, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. What a beautiful scene. The heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. In the north of England, they have been digging coal for over a century. The miners dig, digging the coal go miles and miles away from the central shaft, so there's always danger of the men getting lost. On one particular day, two miners did lose their way out of the mine. Their lights finally went out and they were in danger of losing their lives. After wandering around in the darkness for a long time, they sat down and one of them said, let us sit perfectly still and see if we can feel the way in which the air is moving because it always moves toward the shaft. They sat there for a long time when suddenly one of them felt a slight touch of air on his cheek. Up he sprang to his feet exclaiming, I felt it. They went in the direction from which the air was moving and reached the central shaft and freedom from their dark captivity. As you may know, the Hebrew word for spirit, ruach, is also the word for wind or breath. In a very real way, we also need to feel the movement of the air, do we not? We need to experience the movement of the wind of God's spirit in our life. The great theologian Emil Brunner put it this way, as children lost in a woods are fearful of a, the sinister darkness, and then suddenly hearing a sound from the somber blackness, a familiar voice, a loving, seeking, helping voice, their mother's voice, so prayer is our reply to the voice from the Word of God in Jesus Christ, which suddenly cries out to us in the mysterious dark universe. It's the Father calling us out of the world's darkness. He calls us, seeks us, wants to bring us to himself. Where are you, my child? Our prayer means, here I am, Father. 
I was afraid until you called. Since you have spoken, I am no longer afraid. Come, I am waiting for you. Take me, lead me by the hand through the dark, terrifying world. What happens when we pray? The heaven opens. The wind of God's Spirit blows. And we become new people. That's the wonderful promise of Christian baptism. We can have new life in Christ Jesus. William P. Barker tells about a machinist with the Ford Motor Company in Detroit who had over a period of years borrowed various parts and tools from the company in which he had not bothered to return. While this practice was not condoned, it was more or less accepted by management at Ford and nothing was done about it. The machinist, however, experienced a Christian conversion. He was baptized and became a devout believer. Even more importantly, he took his baptism seriously. The very next morning, he arrived at work loaded down with tools and all the parts he had taken from the company during the years. He explained the situation to his foreman and added that he'd never really meant to steal them and hoped that he'd be forgiven. The foreman was so astonished and impressed by his action that he cabled Mr. Ford himself, who was visiting a European plant, and explained the entire event in detail. And immediately Ford cabled back, Damn up the Detroit River, he said, and baptize the entire city. <laughs> we can only hope that every Christian takes his or her baptism that seriously. When Jesus prayed on the day he was baptized, the heaven opened and the Spirit, Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Something like that should happen at some time in our life. Baptism at its best should result in our becoming a new person. We should become aware of our identity as part of the family of God. We should discover that we too are children of God. The late Reverend Dr. John Claypool, an outstanding author and Episcopalian priest, once told a moving story that came out of World War I. At the end of that terrible conflict, the government of France was faced with an unusual problem. In their ho army hospitals were over 100 soldiers who had developed total amnesia caused by battle trauma. These men could not remember their name, their names, their families, their hometowns. They were totally separated from their origins. Finally, the government announced to the whole nation that all families who had relatives missing in action should come to a certain hospital on an appointed day. For this occasion, a large platform was erected. With the families gathered around the platform, the soldiers were let out one by one in the hope that somebody would recognize them and they could be reunited with their loved ones. Can you imagine the relief and the joy that those soldiers experienced when they were reunited with loved ones and thereby rediscovered their identity? That's the sort of thing that can happen in our life when we're in the habit of maintaining continuous contact with God through prayer. When Jesus prayed, on the day he was baptized, the heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you're my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Until we meet again, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Amen.